Well, yes, the government is censoring you, and yes, they know that it's wrong, and in fact, they are hiring agencies that have experimented with the idea of taking your bank account if you are talking about the narratives that they don't like. Uh, this is not new, but this is a new revelation from journalist Michael Schellenberger and his partners over at Public. It's what they're calling the CTIL files. That stands for Cyber Threat Intelligent League. So I'm going to try and call it the CTIL files, even though that does not roll off the tongue. Uh, here is his big expose that was released just this week. He claims that these revelations are even worse than the Facebook and Twitter files, which were bad enough. Now, all of this is coming from a whistleblower. He only gives us a slow drip of it. So we don't get actually a lot of these training videos and things like that, but he summarizes it. So let's go through it because the media is pretty silent about all of this. It just makes me wonder every time I think the Twitter files were huge. I think the Facebook files were huge. We had concrete evidence that the government downranks and punishes people for talking against the narrative that they promote, even for saying true things and for saying things we should have the freedom to say. So I think that's shocking. I have not ceased to be shocking, even though the Twitter files started coming out in December. So I've had a year to be shocked and I'm just as shocked. OK, join me in being outraged that this is happening because it's a First Amendment vi violation. But it makes me wonder if Edward Snowden were to release his documents today, do you think the media would treat it like this, radio silence? Do you think Snowden would have got the media today had he, I mean, it's been 10 years <clears throat> since. It's, you know, it's hard to say because we, we had uh, last year, we had these CIA revelations. Yeah. And as Glenn Greenwald lamented, those sort of came and went. Wait a minute. We're learning arguably as big a story as the NSA story last year when the CIA, you know, racket unfolded and we learned what the CIA was doing to the American people. And that kind of came and went. It kind of came and then just disappeared. Yeah. Are we so desensitized? We're just like, fine. They're just going to they're invading everything that we do now. They're watching everything that we do. They're manipulating us, blocking our bank accounts. They've taken control of dams and power infrastructure and utility companies. And we're fine with that. Like, we're just fine with that I, now. I think it would have been well, treated just like the Biden laptop story. Like, I think that, like, the publishers wouldn't have published it the way that they did. And I think that anything that was online, they would have made it sound like propaganda and covered it up. I don't think it would have ever gotten the the, yeah. the, the, the way that it did when it was released. Yeah, I think the NSA story, the right. Edward think, Snowden story would just be like, yeah, be like a Twitter files and it would kind of live for a week and that's it. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we also have like as a population, we we like have Stockholm syndrome with with this stuff. Like it, like half the population seems to be like, no, we like this. We like this censorship. They're keeping us safe. They, yeah. We want them surveilling us. And it's like, what the hell are you talking about? Right. Right. Uh, I also think the media was not complicit in the way the NSA was spying on the population. They had no role in that. But with the things that have been censored through government agencies, the media has been complicit. We're gonna see exactly why in calling these disfavored narratives crazy. So the media is in bed with downranking these types of stories, these types of reports, they've been complicit. So if they now are covering the fact that the government is censoring these types of topics, they would it would be a tacit admission that they did it too. Uh, so I think that that's why their silent is so loud and unacceptable, but we're gonna talk about it because I think it's important. So um, it is yet further proof that the government has been grabbing power that it should not have to censor. So what do we know? Well, a whistleblower told the team over at Public that they work for this CTIL and that they were doing censorship work on behalf of the government. Um, it was not just COVID. The report says that this was born in 2016. Um, he says it was a reaction to Brexit and tr uh, Trump, uh, which some call it Trump exit. I'm going to call it that because I think it's funny. Um, here is the gist of what the marching orders were, saying the whistleblower's documents describe everything from the genesis of modern digital censorship programs to the role of the military and intelligence agencies, partnerships with civil society organizations and media, commercial media, and the use of sock puppet accounts and other offensive techniques. Uh, one of the documents said, lock your shit down, your spy disguise. So you're going to go online as somebody else 
and infiltrate these groups and see what these wrong narratives are so that we can go and knock them out. Um, another said that this was typically uh, done by the CIA and the NSA, but they had to go through these sort of workarounds because these censorship efforts they knew were against, um, they were against Americans instead of things that they had just techniques they had developed to spy on other non-Americans for security reasons. Uh, you know, so they knew that they needed these partners because they did not have the legal authority. Now, this whistleblower says that at this CTI League, a former British intelligence analyst was in the room at the Obama White House in 2017 when she received the instructions to counter disinformation to stop a repeat of 2016. So what does that mean? Let's keep looking at that for a little bit longer. What does that mean that Obama was there or just at the Obama White House? We're not quite sure. I, I don't think we can <coughs> defer. What we do know is that it was the outgoing Obama administration, it would seem, that was upset about Trump being elected uh, and wanted to make sure that something like that never happened. Now, as someone who I, I don't mind telling you, I was upset when Trump was elected in 2016. And at the time, I sort of bought into Hillary Clinton's idea that Trump voters were this uneducated basket of deplorables. It was an elitist way to feel. But that's how I felt at the time. I'm embarrassed and I've apologized for that. But there was this movement amongst people who thought like this, that, oh, we are educated, but Trump voters are not. So we need to educate them on why they should not have voted for this guy. I'm embarrassed to even say it, but that's sort of like that was the sentiment, right? Around all of these like empower, women's empowerment. I was a part of this Facebook group called Pantsuit Nation, all about like Hillary Clinton wearing pantsuits <laughs> and how like we were wow. empowered by her. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that now because she's a murderer. <laughs> she's a demon. Like she's a murderer in a pantsuit, right? Yeah. But this was the way that these, I, I was a part of this. Um, so if you had asked me then if those people, these basket of deplorables should be censored, I probably would have said yes. So you can see how fast this idea of like, you know, these people think this way, they're uneducated and we need to like stop them from talking in an uneducated way, how that goes like so fast to censorship. I don't feel like that anymore. Well, a I, bunch I, of people in our chat say, Natalie, I thought that I, th I thought the same way back then. OK. Bing Bing Bo Biddy says, I forgive you, Natalie. And uh, you well, educated yourself. Very good. Right. I think that it's important to understand, like, how this narrative, you know, was presented and how someone can then sort of read their way out of it and realize, well, that's a classist way to feel. Well, actually, you know, that's not true. And if you talk to these voters, there's a completely different way that you missed. And also, it is their right to feel this way, whether I like it or not. So, yes, I've come away a long, a long way. Go ahead, David. I was just going to point out Brandon, Brandon Straka, who's been on the show a couple times, he cr admitted to crying when Hillary Clinton lost, and he started a whole movement called Walk Away, where it's people who were in the same boat as you back then and who have walked away from that way of thinking, and it's a huge movement. Yeah, I cried for days about it as well. Um, <laughs> So, uh, okay, where are we? We're, okay, so we're talking about censorship and how I can sort of see where that would have come from, but it's very clear to me that it's your right to disagree with me. And it's your right to say so on the internet, on a postcard, writing it on chalk in front of your house. That, that should absolutely be your right. So this is what the government did though, is decide, this is wrong think, we don't like it, it's not their right, let's go and downrank it, have these people punished, and see if we can otherwise infiltrate these groups in order to make sure that this speech doesn't happen. Uh, this is why they used non-government organizations or NGOs. Some of these organizations are names we've seen before in the Twitter files and the Facebook files. Uh, here's what they, you know, some of these think tank groups that they had to use in order to indirectly communicate. Um, they say, Michael Schellenberger says that a large trove of documents, including strategy documents, training videos, presentations, and internal messages, reveal that in 2019, US and UK military and intelligence contractors, led by a former defense researcher, Sarah Jane or SJ Terp, developed the sweeping censorship framework. 
Uh, these are the partners that partnered with the CISA in the spring of 2020. Now, the CISA is the Department of Homeland Security's branch. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about this SJ Terp because she seems to be at the helm of a lot of these orders to do bad things. Um, so what they're saying is that they were censoring what we would call wrong think, but here's how they put it. Heavy focus on stopping disfavored narratives, not just wrong facts. Now we know Mark Zuckerberg admitted that they've been asked to downrank and censor even true information. We saw in the Twitter files with Twitter employees happily messaging each other saying, this is true, but let's still censor it because the government wants us to. We know that misinformation has nothing to do with facts, nothing. It's only about things that they don't want you to see. Um, it talks about how they started tracking this disfavored content. And some of, if we could just put that last one back on the screen, some of this disfavored content was anti-lockdown narratives. That's interesting, right? Uh, this organization did research on indivisu individuals even who were posting with these hashtags. So if you had put something like free CA, which is free California, like, get us out of lockdowns, then you earned yourself a little spot on their list for them to see who you are. And then they would work with social media to take you down. Uh, says this went far beyond censorship. The documents show that they were in an offensive operation. So basically psychological operations, they were disguising themselves, creating fake accounts so that they could they called them sock puppet accounts so that they could infiltrate private groups and control the conversation there too. So if you're on like, say a, a private signal group or a private WhatsApp group that you have to get in by an, a moderator letting you in so that you can talk about certain things, they would say the right words to get in there and they would work undercover to see what kind of stuff you guys are talking about and then either track you, figure out you know who you are and what you're up to um, or change the conversation somehow. Um, now, do we know for sure that CTIL was working with the government? Well, here's what we do know about that. The whistleblower says that they were recruited to participate um, through monthly cybersecurity meetings hosted by the Department of Homeless Security. Um, he said the FBI didn't comment, CISA didn't comment, uh, this TERP and CTIL leaders, they didn't comment. But one person... Um, who, you know, sounds kind of like an idiot that I confess that I was in 2016, said, all I can comment is that I joined this league, which is unaffiliated with any government organizations, because I wanted to combat the inject bleach nonsense online during COVID. I can assure you that we had nothing to do with the government, though. Um, I'm sure that person's nice and not uppity at all. Uh, and then there is this one person who was actively involved in all of these meetings who had a DHS um, account and was definitely a government employee. Now, the whistleblower also said this, that the this lady, Terp, um, she said the goal was to become a part of the federal government. And you got bonuses if you did that. Um, you know, all of these people were involved. It talks about, and if you look at the, the bottom half of this screen, it says a major that they were working with this AMITT uh, with about a one to $2 billion funding in government tax money. So that's your money. Um, and so, you know, they all worked together to work on this censorship framework. Um, and, you know, at one point, this woman Terp, who is running this organization, says that she can't even believe, let's go to the next screen. She says, you know, we're, we're working in the background here. Um, but she said she expressed her own apparent surprise that she would ever use such tactics developed by foreign nationals against American citizens. Like, wow, we're really, we're really violating their freedoms, right? I never thought I'd be doing this to Americans, but we have to because they're wrong, because they're deplorables. Um, according to the whistleblower, roughly 12 to 20 active people working with CTIL were FBI or CISA. Uh, now, they even went so far as to get people unbanked with what they th for what they thought was disfavored narratives. Um, it says that it called for training influencers to spread the message and calls for trying to get banks to cut off financial services to individuals who organized rallies or events. Well, 
huh, that's interesting. Where have we seen that before? Organizers of disfavored narrative events getting their bank accounts hmm. cut off. <clears throat> that does sound familiar, Justin Trudeau. Uh, that sounds familiar January 6th. Yeah. We had uh, somebody uh, in our chat tonight just said, you know, we cover bank accounts being shut down. Someone in our chat just said they had their bank accounts shut down. And they said, you guys were right. Redacted was right. Yeah, there you go. So someone just had their bank account shut down. Yeah. I don't know. Other people are saying, I don't know what kind of lists I'm on. Other people are saying, yeah, this is this is happening. And we've had a lot of people, we've had guests on our show who've had their bank accounts shut down just for their political speech. Yeah. Right? Uh, well, now we know where this came from and why they, you know, <laughs> this is, it, it's not accidental. Um, we also have seen uh, FBI documents showing that Christians have ha have been unbanked. Um, we, we reported on those documents recently. Um, so all this to say, they are doing this. They are deciding what can be upranked or downranked. They're putting people on lists. They're asking social media to punish these people, downrank them or shadow ban them. Uh, and they're all doing this under the guise of misinformation. I've said this many times. Even if you use the word misinformation or disinformation about your life's work, um, that is terrifying and inappropriate mind control. You should let people have all information and decide what information they want to talk about, even if you don't like it. Even if you are, like me, a reformed elitist, uh, you should absolutely come around to the idea that everybody should get the right to speak as long as it is not actually inciting violence, which these words about COVID lockdowns were not. Uh, so there will be a congressional hearing about this on Thursday, uh, featuring Matt Taibbi, once again, Michael Schellenberger and Rapa Subramanya, um, this journalist from the free Pass press. So we'll see if they have more about this whistleblower. I, I hope that there's a lot here. It's worth tuning in to and watching it and we'll watch it as well. Uh, so let us know what you think. And um, there was a comment here about this sort of elitist attitude that I am admitting to saying, well, you look down on anyone that has a callus on their hands. That's not it. It's it's not elitist and, you know, upper class or anything like that. It just was this idea that we see played out in the media. And I think that's why I find myself um, a bit uniquely qualified to dismantle it in the work that I do right now. Because I understand how these people who think this way may think that they're well-intentioned um, and then like, oh, but we're going to educate these people with a callus on their hand. And I apologize for that as well. Um, and I have many times. But, um, yeah, I think it's important to let you know, you know, yeah. this, this arc of realization that comes from a reformed liberal. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.